Tonight, um, we have our famous chef, executive chef, Tim from Culinary Cafe, Tim Lipman. And we've been uh, together for a long, long time, since uh, the opening of his restaurant. I remember him when he used to come to the market, and you, he looked like such a small little kid. I said, what's that kid want to open a restaurant for? But look at this now. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I ask myself that sometimes, too. <laughs> So if you don't know where his new restaurant is, uh, it's r right next door to the old culinary. So please patronize him and his new place. Becca is with us tonight. Becca is the pastry chef over there. So we're proud of her. Every time she came here, she did such a good job demonstrating how to make fancy cakes. And tonight she'll make us a nice panna cotta. So enjoy it tonight, okay? Everybody can hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Carl, Diane, so much uh, for having us back out here again. Um, you're very kind in all your words. I, I think famous is a bit overstated, but uh, <laughs> it's all good. Um, again, very grateful to be here. We've been working with Diane now for 10 years. We have our 10-year anniversary coming up on March 5th. Um, very, very cool, um, very thankful to be at this point in, in our careers and in our lives and uh, to be here 10 years later still doing this and yes, much older, a lot more gray and um, you know, still enjoying every minute of it. We've been able to grow our family both with the restaurant, my wife and I just had a baby not too long ago. Um, very, very cool to see the evolution of all of this and, and the evolution of the farm and, and uh, you know, our restaurants. Becca's been with us for so long now. And, um, you know, I, I just, I, I can't thank all of you guys enough for the support that you've given us over all the years. I'm looking forward to a great night tonight. Um, I, I was actually uh, uh, speaking with you just a couple of minutes ago. And with all the craziness going on right now, we had, we opened the restaurant on a Friday and on the following Tuesday, we had our son. So um, we're not short of busy days and busy nights right now. But um, I dragged my feet getting Diane the menu for tonight and I have to apologize. I still have not sent you the panna cotta recipe. But um, I was so worried that I had not gotten her the... Uh, recipes. And I was like, Diane, we got to get this online real quick. I was like, we got to start selling tickets. Like, oh my God, what if I show up and nobody's there? She's like, you have been sold out. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, are you serious? She's like, yeah, yeah, you, you've been sold out. I was like, well, thank you guys so much. <laughs> um, again, that just goes to show the support that you guys have given us for so many years. And it's so special to be in this position. There are a lot of chefs out there that never get to know any of their customers, and I just could never do that. It's just not who we are. It's not what we do. Um, we have always, always talked and, and dreamed about uh, 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 being not just a neighborhood restaurant, right, or you know, more than a restaurant in a neighborhood. We really wanted to be part of that community culture and uh, you guys are so special to us. So thank you again for being here. Um, in the meantime, let's go ahead and get started. A couple things we're gonna work with tonight, okay? We're gonna be a little bit simple. We're gonna have some fun with it. We're gonna talk about some cool ingredients that Diane has. Um, but the first thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna talk about just a very simple Caesar dressing. So this is something that um, I know for myself, there's nights you're sitting at home, what are we going to have for dinner? You never really quite know. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, you know, really wish I wanted to see, you know, I, I could get a Caesar salad. People become intimidated when it comes to making dressings. And I understand that, the emulsification process of preparing a, a, a good dressing. And then you're throwing anchovy into something that can be super intimidating. And I get that. If you've ever tasted anchovy on its own, it's not the most pleasing thing in the world for a lot of people. Um, I can tell you there are some really, really great quality white anchovies and olive oil straight from Italy that I tell you what, you're going to put on a piece of bread and eat it just like it is. But that's not always available to everybody. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going to create a real quick Caesar dressing that 
pretty much all of you are going to have all of these ingredients in your pantry at home. All you have to do is pick up a tube of anchovy. Um, and that's relatively expensive, and that is available at any grocery store. Publix, Walmart, wherever you guys go, order it on Amazon. That's where I get everything now. Um, so we're going to start really with just a good quality mayo. So this is already emulsified for you, so you don't really have to do too much, right? Um, I use Dukes. I like Dukes. You guys use whatever you prefer. Some are more acidic. Some are more sweet. It's up to you. It's a total preference. So we're starting with just two cups of mayo. And this is going to be able to make a dinner for four to six um, with leftovers. And because you're using a store-bought mayo, this is going to hold in your refrigerator for probably a couple weeks at least. Um, what will happen is the anchovy will start to take over over time. So it's not going to be something that a month down the road you're going to be like, oh, this is still great. That's probably not going to happen. Um, but at least a couple of weeks, th th this will work. So we're just starting with um, a store-bought mayo. And then all we're adding, that's not the right stuff. Yeah, it is. Uh, Worcestershire, Dijon mustard, a little bit of dry oregano, and uh, some Parmesan cheese, and anchovy paste. So again, I'm doing this just so that we talk about how easy these things can really become, right? You know, um, making dressings at home is super simple. You can play with this type of recipe and do just a ton of different things with it. Um, you can add different herbs, you can add different seasonings, and it's all gonna come together really nicely. So just a little bit of Dijon. Good Worcestershire, I like Lee and Perrins, but again, that's all a preference. Dried oregano, guys, whenever you're buying dry spices, never buy the most expensive, never buy the cheapest. Super expensive dry spices aren't going to get you any better, but really, really cheap dry spices, there's definitely a difference. With something like a dried oregano, you're going to get really woodiness to it, um, just a, a real lack of freshness, and you'll find like stems and stuff in it. So just, you know, find that kind of middle ground. Anchovy paste. Really, really great stuff. Anchovy paste also is going to last forever. You don't have to worry about that. So then with this, we're just going to kind of mix this a little bit. And you guys will see in the recipe that I said to add a lot of that, uh, add your lemon and your Worcestershire and I think your Dijon mustard in the very beginning. You're going to add that to... Um, the anchovy, and I'll tell you why. It's kind of just so that you make sure that you're mixing your anchovy really well. You don't want a big chunk of anchovy in there. Um, I can look at it and know that I'm, I'm mixed in pretty well, but for you guys at home, I definitely suggest starting off with that, and, and it just kind of creates like this Honestly, kind of like a little ugly kind of brown sauce in the bottom of the bowl. Um, but it allows you to kind of incorporate that anchovy much better. And then I'm just adding a little bit of lemon juice here, just the juice of one lemon. If you find that your lemon doesn't have a lot of juice to it, you can add two. Again, a little bit of a personal preference here. You know, I make homemade ranch dressing at home as well. Um, I do like a creamy tomato dressing, basic vinaigrettes. It just... You know, that store-bought stuff has so many weird ingredients in it that um, this is much easier to do. And then we just add a little bit of Parmesan at the end. You can get sloppy with it. It's okay. That's what makes cooking fun. And then now you can see where, there we go. So you see nice, creamy. Now, Caesar dressing should be thick like this, okay? What you're pouring out of a bottle coming from the store, it's not going to grip onto anything. Now, when you think about lettuce, right, lettuce is, you know, 99% water. So especially with something like a Caesar, when you're talking, you're using just like romaine lettuce, it's nothing but water. If you don't have a dressing that's really going to grip onto that, it's just not going to, you're not going to be happy with it. So you want this little bit of color here. You see it's got a little bit of brownness to it. It's got some chunkiness from the cheese. This is Primo right here. Really, really great. 
So homemade dressing is done. Now we're going to talk about one of the ingredients that Diane's been growing for maybe a little over a year now, right? Seltus. So this is what Seltus looks like. It's also known as water lettuce, um, celery lettuce. I've heard it called like asparagus lettuce. Um, it has a really magnificent, like nutty flavor to it. It's very watery. And when you eat it raw, slightly smoky on the back end. Um, you want to peel the outside. The outside of this vegetable is very fibrous. You can see where these are like little leaves as it's growing up out of the ground. You pull that stuff off. But there is a layer. Can you see this little outside corner kind of edging there? You got to peel all that off. Um, it's going to be very fibrous, like a hard to eat celery. So really, a peeler is going to be a nightmare. I'm going to be honest with you. Just cut it with a knife, and you can see how beautiful that is again on the inside. It's got beautiful color to it. And then, can everybody see this? You're just going to slice right down. You can peel it if you really want to fight with it. But I'm going to tell you now, this is your best bet. And you get everything off, and you can see... Y'all can see from all the way back there, it almost looks like a frozen vegetable, right? You know, when you pull something out of the refrigerator that kind of froze on you a little bit, it's almost translucent. This is what you're looking for. Now, Seltus actually originated in the Mediterranean. And uh, during, I think, the Tang, Tang, Tang Dynasty, it somehow migrated over to mainland uh, Asia. And that's primarily where you're going to see it now. That's the, the, the cuisine that you're going to see it most in. It's really great raw, and for the application that we're doing today is raw. Um, but you can also use it in stir fries. You can chop it. Um, I wouldn't really do it in like a pasta, but served over like rice with some chicken and some broccoli, uh, a couple of spicy chilies or something like that. And this is going to be a really cool ingredient to, to add to your repertoire at the house. Um, I know Diane has had it at the market just recently. There's a couple of other guys growing it locally, but not a lot of it around. And this is something really cool. If you see it, pick it up, take it home. It's very versatile and tastes really, really good. So what we're actually doing with it today is we're just slicing it and we're mixing it with a little bit of raw onion, some actual celery, um, some of the tops, the leafy tops from this and um, tossing it with the Caesar dressing. So you get this beautiful little crunchy kind of celery and saltus salad. It, it does oxidize a little bit on you as well. So if you cut it and let it sit, say for 24 hours or so, it may start to brown a little bit on the edges, but it's not gonna hurt you at all. You know, um, you see that sometimes with a lot of like your stalky type vegetables, right? Broccoli sometimes does that. Um, you know, uh, uh, what's another one that may do that on you? Um, I mean, even celery sometimes gets that little hollow going up the ribs, you know. Um, that may be a little bit of malnutrition for the plant. Um, that would probably be my guess. Um, just in that particular area, you know, it may have a little pocket of soil that it's just not incredibly happy with. Um, or it maybe got a little bit of a fungus or something in it. But again, it's not going to hurt you. You can cut around it and eat it. Um, it's super tender. And that's, that's all it is. It's super cool, yeah. So these are definitely really big. Um, but they're fantastic. I mean, I, I don't see anything wrong with these. They're not, they're not fibrous to the core. It's almost milky. You can see some of these like milky saps coming out of it. It's really a fantastic vegetable. I love that you're growing this now. <laughs> and I will keep using it. So we're going to have this kind of a cool little vegetable, right? Easy little dressing to throw together. And the Celtis, I absolutely love it. I think you guys could envision a number of different things that that vegetable could be used on from a fried fish sandwich to, I mean, obviously it works in a salad. Um, and then like we talked about earlier, taking it and possibly throwing it into a stir fry or something. Very cool. Um, but again, you know, when we talk about kind of making dressings at home, you know, some of these classes, I think that they're, they're as much about creating ease and reassuring that, you know, everyone in this room can be a cook if they really want to. 
it's um it, it's a lot less intimidating to make things simpler than what most people make them out to be you know making dressing is something that's just so simple and uh you know in my opinion much better for you and most of the time we have all of these ingredients in our pantries and refrigerators at home so this is kind of going outside the box a little bit but some of you have heard about grilled romaine right so if you took this guy and you cut it right about where this stalk starts to peel off, the center of it is still pretty tight in here. So if you cut this off right here, you cleaned it up a little bit, you spritzed that with a little bit of olive oil and some salt pepper, threw that right on the grill, I bet that would be pretty awesome. I bet that would. You know, you could sear that up. You could do a beautiful just like lemon garlic kind of dressing right on top of it with a nice piece of roast chicken or some chicken thighs or, you know, a beautiful piece of seared fish. You get the smokiness from the grill here and just pan sear your fish one side down and just nice lush kind of tender fish on the back side, a little crispy and some nice smoky grilled saltus. I think that'd be pretty awesome. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's a ton of fun things. You could pickle this. Why not, right? Take this and pickle it. A little bread and butter, some mustard seeds, a little coriander, some turmeric, a little brown sugar. This would make a killer little bread and butter pickle. Absolutely. I would julienne it maybe. You know, throw it on a julienne. I'd be careful on a box grater. It's so watery that a lot of that water would probably come out of it. But if you, you, if you happen to have like a little Japanese mandolin at home, um, or really, I mean, if you, right, like they taught us in culinary school, they never let you use a mandolin. It's like, no, you're, you're going to julienne in 500 pounds of carrots. But if you start and then you just get to a, uh, you know, a flat side, right? So you've got a beautiful little guy like that. Now you can... Julienne this up. And really, they actually did make you just julienne like 500 pounds of carrots. <laughs> I started off in the country clubs, guys, and, and I would walk into work, and first thing they would hand me was 10 cases of potatoes, and they're like, you're going to stand here for the next eight hours and peel potatoes. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's really nice right there, you know? Take a little practice with some knife work, but I think you guys got it in you. I love this stuff. Yeah. Just make sure that you're peeling the outside. You're not going to enjoy the fibrousness of this. So it looks like they're starting to clear everybody up. I don't see very many people eating anymore. You guys okay if I start with this next course? Yeah? Okay. So again, we're going to talk about another vegetable that Diane grows here. And it's something that, again, I think people may get a little bit intimidated about. And it's eggplant. Um, I know for a lot of people, eggplant is kind of a put off. Um, I personally really love it. Um, you know, growing up in a Sicilian family, my mother was, or my grandmother was Sicilian. And we, we had a lot of eggplant. And the eggplant that she always used was your more traditional Italian eggplant. You always, the real big bulbs, lots of seeds on the inside. You always had to salt it and soak it and do all this work with it and all these crazy things. And it's like, Nana, like, this is crazy. Like, you're doing all this work for this thing. It tastes like crap. Like, I can't stand it. <laughs> um, well, she made me eat it, you know. Um, we, we definitely, we didn't get away with not eating stuff in our house. Um, and Diane grows a lot of different eggplant here, but today what we're working with is actually Japanese eggplant. That's the very long, slender one that you see in the stores. Um, so it's uh, the, the same kind of purpley skin, right? And they're elongated like this, okay? Um, now, with Japanese eggplant, you don't technically even have to peel the outside. I still peel the outside because I like it. There it is. For restaurant purposes, we peel it. But this is what it looks like. 
very cool little little product here. Um, and again, the skin is super tender. Like, I mean, I can take my thumb, and I mean, I, I just that's that's how simple it is. And this particular eggplant is very sweet. It's got very few seeds on the inside, as you can see. Um, and it makes a beautiful capanata. So in honor, I think, maybe of my, my grandmother, we're doing a, an Italian-focused dinner tonight. So we're going to do caponata. Caponata is something that um, is served uh, early on in the meal. It could be an appetizer, maybe with your charcuterie. Um, but it's also really great to be served again over maybe some like oregano marinated like chicken thighs and rice with a little bit of this eggplant resting right on top um you can also bake it into a beautiful dish with like nice feta cheese and like a little bit of like mozzarella on top and turn it into like a beautiful hot dip so this is something that's super versatile and you can do a lot of cool things with it so um you know caponata i think a lot of people just kind of see it as an appetizer but it's something that once you get into your repertoire, you realize there's a lot of different things I can do with this. And again, it goes really great with fish too. Um, so first thing we're going to do is just a, a, like a medium hot pan. And really, we just took the eggplant, cut the end off, peeled it down. This is what it looks like. It does oxidize very quickly. Don't worry about it turning brown. It's going to do this within five minutes. So it's not going bad. Okay, it can sit in your refrigerator like this for a day or two. What will happen is this flesh will actually start kind of absorbing the moisture out of the air. So once it's peeled, this is this is a protective barrier, right? Once it's peeled and it's in your refrigerator, it will start to soften on you. And that is, you know, the nature of the eggplant. It's kind of spongy, right? It's going to start absorbing that, that moisture. But you're just going to take a medium hot pan, and you're literally just going to put it right into the pan. And you see that little bit of sizzle there? That's what we want. And you're just going to keep cooking that. Now, you don't really want to mess with it too much. I'm going to cut this one in half. If you have like a little plancha at home, you can do it in the plancha, you can do it in a pan. Um, you could technically do this in a broiler. Um, I don't think you would get the same result. You're not going to caramelize as nicely as you would in a little saute pan. Um, and it doesn't have to be Teflon neither. This is something that you really need to season really well. Okay. And then when it's done cooking, this is what it's going to look like. Like you see how dark that is. Like, this is really dark, and I mean, it is really cooked. So let it go for a while. It's okay to really create that color and get that caramelization on this eggplant. I know it's not the most beautiful thing in the world, but I tell you what, it's really tasty. So you get good color on it, and you start to see the natural juices coming out of this. It's got a, a, a decent amount of protein in it, too. Uh, you'll see that in the bottom of your uh, uh, resting pan, when you pull it off and let it kind of hang out for a little bit, the juices that come out will actually start to coagulate. And that's, that's the little bit of the proteins in the eggplant. So just while you're cooking this, you're gonna give it a few minutes on each side. Don't be afraid, get good color on it. You don't wanna burn it, but you want good brown and this is what's gonna happen to it. Now, from there, you're gonna kind of pull it off. You're gonna let that cool off a little bit, okay? Don't want to work with it while it's too hot. Now, the beauty of caponata, you can serve it hot. You can serve it room temperature. You can serve it ice cold, really whatever you want. Just going to kind of take it and kind of cut right down the middle of these eggplants. Use a sharp knife. If you don't have a sharp knife for, for eggplant after you cook it, it's going to be a mess. And then just chop it into these little kind of cubes. It's going to look like it's falling apart on you. It absolutely is. <laughs> you want that. If the eggplant's not falling apart and if it's not completely brown, it's not cooked enough. So you can see it's really, I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like mush in my hand. I like it like that. That's when you're going to have the sweetest and the best flavor of eggplant. So once I have that eggplant, in my caponata, I do... Kalamata olives, and I do golden raisins. There's any number of things you could put into this. You could do caramelized onions. 
you can do um, like if you got into more of like Middle Eastern type uh, cooking, you may see you're gonna see dishes similar to this. You may see like apricots um, or or some other different types, maybe dried currants. Um, so for this application today, just golden raisins and a little Kalamata olive. We're just going to slice them in half. What I really love about this is that you get this beautiful, like, richness of the eggplant. And then you get sweet uh, 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 golden raisins and then this pop of saltiness from the Kalamata olive. Listen, if you don't have Kalamatas and you only have blacks, use them. It's okay. If you have brown raisins and not golden, it's okay. <laughs> it is totally okay. And then we're going to make another quick dressing. Another super easy guy. If you guys have some fresh herbs outside or something like that, get it, chop it, add it. If you don't, you can add a little bit of dried oregano or some dried basil. Um, honestly, it's really good without. So with our dressing, and this, is, uh, this can be a dressing for a salad. This could be a marinade. Um, one of the restaurants I worked at years ago, I used to do a balsamic marinade on a skirt steak. It's really, really great. Um, so this is, again, this is a, a mid-range balsamic. If you buy cheap balsamic, you're going to know it. If you buy the really, really, really expensive balsamic, you're probably not going to notice. You're just spending your money. Unless you're going to a really high-end, like, market, I mean, your most expensive balsamic, vine uh, balsamic vinegar at Publix, it's exactly the same as the mid-range. So we're just starting with balsamic in here, right? I think uh, the recipe was like a quarter cup, right? Yep. Um, honey. This is orange blossom honey. We use a local honey. Uh, you can use whatever you want, wildflower or something like that. Uh, we, we really like the orange blossom. And it's good for your sinuses this time of year. I don't know if you guys have seen all the pollen on the cars, but goodness gracious, I can't wash my truck enough. So balsamic right into the bottom of the jar. Equal parts, orange blossom honey. Okay. About a teaspoon of raw chopped garlic. Chopped, not minced, guys. Never mince your garlic. You know, there's several different stages of garlic, and the amount at which you chop it and process it, the flavor changes. So... As, a, as a, a chef and a cook and somebody who loves to cook Italian food, I can't eat a lot of garlic. But if the garlic is sliced and the garlic is properly roasted in a pan, I can eat it all day long. Minced garlic, I cannot. So the more you start to beat that up and the acids start to come out of the garlic, it starts to change that profile on the garlic. So anytime you can, try to chop your own garlic. So... So far, we have balsamic, we have honey, we have garlic. We're going to slice a lemon, and we're just going to juice some lemon right into this jar. Okay. We're going to put the lid on. Shake it. Yeah, balsamic vinaigrette. Pretty easy, right? If you wanted to change this up and do apple cider vinegar, you can do this same recipe and you have apple cider vinaigrette. You can do white vinegar and add some other herbs to it and now we're looking at more like an Italian dressing, something like that. I always add a little bit of sugar or a little bit of uh, honey that starts to balance a little bit of the acids in the, uh, in the vinaigrette. Not a lot, you don't want it to be sweet, but you need to really balance that acid. It's always a balancing game. So in this bowl, we have eggplant, we have golden raisins, and we have olives. And we're just going to add a little bit of this balsamic to it. And then we're just going to mix it up. Okay. Now, if you're going to do this at home, I suggest letting it rest for, you know, an hour. But honestly, you could eat it right away. It's okay. There's, there, there's no major rules here. Just make it taste good. 
make sure you check your salt and pepper on it, right? You season the eggplant pretty heavily when you were cooking it. You have a lot of salt coming from your olives. So something like this isn't always going to need a lot of salt to it, but definitely check it. If you're going to serve it with like a nice salty cheese, like a feta or something like that, you could even cut back a little bit more. That's that balancing act that we talk about. Now, again, with this tonight, we're going to serve this with just a beautiful little piece of uh, what's called sesamo. And we buy this from a bakery down in Miami. It's called Sullivan Street Bakery. Uh, Sullivan Street Bakery became famous up in New York, uh, the city of New York, Manhattan, down Sullivan Street. And they do all in-house uh, sour fermentation. And so this is a beautiful sourdough, um, uh, kind of like a Tuscan loaf, and it's just studded with a ton of sesame seed on the outside. So we're just serving it with a little bit of that and some of Diane's beautiful spicy arugula with some olive oil and a little bit more of this lovely balsamic. That's it. Yeah. Now that we're starting to clear and my uh, cream and stock is obviously nice and hot, uh, we're going to talk about this next course. So uh, shrimp and polenta. Shrimp and polenta is something that I cook at home all the time. Uh, it is something that we have on the menu at the restaurant quite often. Uh, polenta, I think, is another one of those things that for some people can be a little bit intimidating. Um, but instant polenta is super simple. Now, this is one of those things that I will tell you that the difference between a very inexpensive polenta and a very expensive polenta, we're actually seeing a big difference here. So you can buy from like a number of farms that you can buy from, but they have fresh polenta. That's a whole nother like world if you're really looking into getting into something like that, like Anson Mills, right? You can call up Anson Mills. Your polenta comes refrigerated and you have to keep it in the refrigerator. So that stuff is not cheap, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but there is a world of difference with it. So if you're really feeling frisky, you wanna get online, you wanna have a good time, they've got a lot of beautiful stuff. Um, but that being said, Instant Polenta is very accessible for everybody. It is at every grocery store, every specialty market. Uh, you pick it up, it's very fine, it's granular, and it literally cooks in five minutes. So this is something that I think all people should have in their pantry. And really the beauty of this, again, is that it's extremely versatile. So you can be using this. Uh, we actually just did a, um, an article for a magazine. It will be coming out next month. But we did a roast chicken and polenta. Uh, we're doing shrimp and polenta here with some of Diane's beautiful produce. Um, you can keep it vegetarian as well and do wonderful crispy roasted mushrooms over top of it if you like. And you can even make it a little bit more dense. So the recipe that we're doing today is more of a creamy style uh, polenta, but you could add a little bit more polenta into that ratio, make it a little bit more dense, put it out on like a little sheet pan like this and make little cakes of it. And then you can pan fry those cakes, make them nice and crispy, serve it for breakfast with a little bit of egg and some sausage or bacon. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that you can do with this. Um, and actually, Becca has made a beautiful polenta cake before. So a lot of really cool things that you can do. And again, we're just going to touch on some stuff that I think... Uh, uh, any of you guys, next time you're shopping, you can be like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I can grab that, throw it into the pantry. And you have it for like five or six dinners. You know, it goes a long way. Uh, the packages do at least. So what I have in here right now is a little bit of stock and cream. Um, I believe this one is uh, equal parts. Now, I use heavy cream because heavy cream is very stable. Um, it's very fatty. It's very lush. It's very rich. Uh, you can throw it on here and it can boil over like it just did and you're not going to have ricotta cheese on your hands. So it is a little bit more stable in that sense. However, that doesn't mean you can't use half and half or you can't use milk or you can't just use stock. So um, again, the way that I'm trying to you know, show you guys things that you can do here is that really whatever you happen to have, you can really make some magic with it. So um, if you happen to have cream, use it. I think it's your best option. However, the other options are, are just as good. So um, 
here we are. I just brought this up to a boil. It's about to come over again. Now, with this, I think it's a four to one, two cups, two cups, and then one cup of instant polenta. So you can see, can you see in here, cream's coming all the way up, right? So we're going to turn this down. Now, polenta will explode and pop on you, and it will absolutely ruin your night. So always, always, always turn this down to a very low simmer, um, and I would prefer if you even pulled it from the stove. So just pull it off of the stove and slowly add this in, okay? And you're just going to whisk just like this. Now keep this on a low until it kind of comes back up. Now once it kind of starts to bubble again, you're starting to cook that polenta. So you see how kind of watery that is right now? You want that. That's a good thing. Trust me, the polenta is going to start to come together. Now, you can take this little recipe and you can do grits with it as well. So I'm also a big fan of Southern cuisine. So you can take this exact same recipe and use a quick grit and it's going to work for you. You can add some cheddar cheese, some jalapenos, serve it with shrimp right? Shrimp and grits, um, a, more, a, a lot of, of other options. Now you're just going to keep whisking this about every 10, 15 seconds. And you just want to be really careful. Just don't let it pop on you. This stuff is like lava. When it lands on, I'm, I'm serious. When it lands on you, it does not come off easily. So don't let it boil. Keep it on a really low simmer. This takes three minutes to cook. There's no reason anybody should ever be scared of this polenta. So we're already approaching go time here, right? So while that's finishing, I've got some shrimp. I've already cooked them up here. And we're just going to bring them back to temp real quick. We got some beautiful Kai Kai tomatoes and Spigarella Alicia. Spigarello Alicia is a, uh, a Italian green. It's in the broccoli and the kale family. Um, it's a firm green. It really doesn't break down all that much when you cook it, but it's still very tender. It can be eaten raw, sliced, real, real thin. You can put it in a salad. You can put it in a slaw, like a kale slaw, right? Um, or you can saute it like a collard green or like a kale or something like that. So in, in this instance, we're actually going to saute it right into our shrimp with a little bit of fresh tomato. So this is what the spigarello looks like. Is this my arugula? Yeah. So long leafy like this, right? And we just cut the stems off. And then we cut them into like little pieces like this. Kind of like, about like the size of like a large spinach. Okay. I'm going to throw that right in. Just let it cook in that beautiful olive oil and kind of fry up. And a splatter a little bit on us. And then we're just going to slice these tomatoes up real quick. Toss them right into this pan. I don't want to cook these tomatoes all the way down. I just want to burst a little bit of water out of it. And I don't know if any of you ever see Diane's tomatoes at the store or at the uh, market, definitely get them. Definitely get them. That's really all you want to do. Very quick. Shrimp are just cooked. The greens are just wilted. The tomatoes are just starting to release some of their moisture. You're hot. You're ready to go. I'm going to show you how to plate this real quick. Okay, do we have it? We give me that spoon. It's great, thank you. So creamy polenta. So you guys can see, right? It's nice and soft. It's not like holds on to the spoon a little bit. You don't want it soupy, but you want it to be nice and thin. You're gonna go right into the middle of that plate. And just make yourself a little well. 
a little well just like that. Clean up your plate because I was a little sloppy there. Shrimp right into the center. A little bit of fresh tomato. Spigarello. Then now all these beautiful juices in the bottom, all this tomato juice that came out, right on top. That's it. That's really all you got to do. I encourage you to continue to play with this because there are so many fun things that you can do with it. There's a ton of different types of cheeses you can do. Um, I didn't even add the Parmesan to it, but you can do cheddar cheese. You can do jack cheese. There's just the... It's endless in terms of what you want to try to do with this. Um, have a lot of fun with it. Try different proteins. Try different vegetables. Go vegetarian with it. Beautiful with a steak as well. Uh, we touched on lamb earlier. Some lamb chops or a roast leg of lamb with a little polenta on the side. Really, really great. This is something that like, I, I eat a lot now, but growing up, we would have big bowls of polenta on the table and just lots of roasted vegetables and meats and... Everybody just loads up on it. We had a big family. We had like nine people. So we we're always eating these types of like inexpensive homey style dishes. So that's it. All right, we'll play it up for you. All right, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Becca, I'm the pastry chef at Culinary. And uh, tonight we're gonna be making an orange honey panna cotta. So the base of this panna cotta is, is really a citrus panna cotta and you can switch out the citrus with really anything you'd like. Uh, you could use lemon, you could use lime, oranges, uh, really anything you have in your house. This panna cotta is very versatile. Uh, we just add the honey on top, so you can switch in and out with whatever you wanna do. So right now, I know you don't have the recipes in front of you, but we will be emailing them to you, so you'll have them shortly. Uh, but we have a uh, three cups of heavy cream in the pot right now, which I'm gonna turn on. And just for time's sake, I did heat it up a little bit in advance. Uh, so you're gonna wanna get your, your cream going. And we're gonna be using gelatin. We're gonna be using powdered gelatin. There's two different kinds of gelatin. You can use either powdered or sheet gelatin. I personally, I like powdered gelatin. I think you can be a bit, I mean, either one's exact. It's just kind of personal preference, but this is really easy to get in the grocery store. And uh, you always wanna have cool or really cold water when you are gonna bloom gelatin. And the cold water just helps to really absorb and get the gelatin uh, a, bit, a bit softer than it is right now. So now it's in a dry state, you, you wanna hydrate it. So I have two and a half teaspoons of gelatin right here, which is the size of an individual pack of gelatin. So you're just gonna add that right into your, uh, right into your cold water. And you wanna mix it in really well. I mean, for the most part, you don't have a whisk that tiny. If you do, that's great. Um, but a fork works really, really well. So I always just typically use a fork. You wanna make sure that you don't have a ton of big clumps or else it doesn't fully hydrate. A couple of small ones are fine because it typically does uh, rehydrate. So you start with that and you really just let that sit. So that needs about five minutes. It can go really as long as you want, but as long as you have five minutes, you're pretty good. So while this is on the heat, this is a very fast uh, burner as you've seen. So <laughs> we're gonna keep it really low. Uh, you add some salt. So it's a quarter teaspoon of salt. You don't need a ton. Um, but it really, I am a huge uh, lover of salt in baked goods. I think it really elevates the flavor. You don't necessarily have to do a ton, but it really does make a huge difference. I have three quarters cup of granulated sugar. So you're gonna add that right in. Um, and this is, again, it's super easy. You just basically throw everything in a pot, get it to a simmer mix in your gelatin and, and pour it. So it's super simple, great to do in advance. If you're having a dinner party, you can make it the night before, just keep it in the fridge. So great for that. Um, because we're making a citrus panna cotta, orange panna cotta, we have our orange here. For this recipe, um, I use half an orange, but if you want something a little bit more like zesty, you can absolutely add the full, uh, the full zest of the orange. So you just 
keep scraping um, if you have a microplane at home. You can also, you can use the smallest setting like on a box grater. It'll just be a bit thicker. Um, so I would suggest a microplane, but if you don't have one, that's okay. So you just get that right in there. And you can kind of give it a little pat. And we are also going to use vanilla bean. So if you don't have vanilla bean, you can use uh, regular vanilla extract too. Uh, and I have it in the recipe, which you will be receiving. Uh, it gives you your amounts for both. So we're gonna use half of vanilla bean. And when you get the vanilla bean, you can get it at um, Whole Foods, Amazon, a lot of specialty shops will have them. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I think I've seen them at Publix a couple times, but not all the time. So you have a vanilla bean, it's basically in the, it's in its pod, but you wanna get the little beans out. So you take a knife, you split it right down the center, and then you take the back of your knife and you scrape. And you take all of the scraped stuff as well as the bean itself and put it right in. And uh, it adds a really, like a nice light flavor. And I, I also like the aesthetic of it. I think the, um, the little, I guess you could say dots in, in the pastries are fun. So <laughs> a little polka dot in there. So you just let that uh, cook. And once it starts to simmer, that's when you can add your gelatin. And you don't want panna cotta to boil. You don't want it to, you can't have it, you know, too low. You do need the simmer for the gelatin to fully um, immerse. So if you do have it too low, there's a chance when it sets up, you'll have a bit of separation. So you want to whisk it really well and definitely make sure that you have a light simmer, uh, which we have going on right now. So then we're just going to add our gelatin. And if you uh, can see the gelatin, it's kind of springy. So now it's a solid and it's a bit spongy and that's when you know that it's really done and ready. So you just scrape all of that in, make sure you get it all in. And it's somewhat like kind of solid at that point. And that's when you just whisk really, really well. And you want to whisk it really well to, again, avoid any separation. But that doesn't really happen a lot, um, but just something to be aware of. And if you want, like, you can add some spices to this. You could add a little bit of cinnamon, um, a little bit of star anise, nutmeg, if you want to, like, get a little bit creative with it. Uh, this is just a great base for really any panna cotta. And you can flavor it how you want. Green cardamom would be delicious in here. And saffron, I, uh, I use this, a similar base, uh, minus, the, minus the zest, which would be good in there too, but add a little saffron and it's delicious. So that's really all panna cotta is. You have your liquid now. Uh, then we're gonna put it right into this measuring cup. You just wanna, it's easier in my opinion to pour it into something else, like a, a small measuring cup is perfect. And then we're just gonna fill, I have some five ounce ramekins right here. Uh, but you can use whatever, like really whatever you have in the house. You could do it in a cup, you could do it in a mason jar. Um, yeah, really whatever you want. And you just fill them about, um, you know, almost all the way up. You don't wanna fill it right to the rim because you will have to move this into the refrigerator and just to avoid spilling on the way, um, which I've done so many times. So uh, yeah, so you just fill them right in here. Uh, put them in the refrigerator for about four hours. It does need a minimum of four hours. Gelatin, anything uh, that you're cooking with gelatin typically takes four hours to set. Uh, but after four hours, you can go ahead and eat it. Uh, but also great to make it advance overnight and serve it the next day. And then I'm going to get so one of our finished products. Then we have some honey. Again, Tim was talking about the local honey that we use, the orange blossom. It's really nice and goes great with our orange panna cotta. So then you're just going to want to Lightly give a nice little drizzle of the honey on top, and uh, that's it. You can eat it with cookies, you can uh, sprinkle some nuts in there, really whatever uh, you wanna do. This is a great base to just get creative. And that's it, that's the panna cotta. Thank you. <laughs>